What did they call you? I asked Sergeant Bird when the vocabulary lesson got too filled with body bags and wounded soldiers for my comfort. He grinned. I was a first cab grunt and a cheap Charlie because I never spent any money in the bars. Other than that, mostly I got called Ted and a few other names too improper to repeat. Oh, and Kodak. I got called Kodak. He held up his camera bag for the obvious reasons. Sergeant Bird was not my only source on the lifestyle and culture of the Vietnam War, however. They were also my students. Just like Private Hollister had said, there were soldiers who wanted to learn how to develop and print their own pictures, and now I was the resident expert, if you didn't count Sergeant Bird. Since he didn't actually work at the rec center, I didn't count him. The first soldier I helped was Corporal Yarrow. Corporal Yarrow was the saddest looking human being I'd ever seen. Hang dog eyes worse than a basset hound's, bushy black eyebrows that sagged to a point above the bridge of his nose, that he always had a joke or smart aleck comment coming out of the side of his mouth was my first surprise about him. That he was so smart he could cuss in German, French, and Spanish without anybody having ever taught him how was my second. His first surprise about me was that I was 12 years old. He'd come hollering into the dark room. Hollister said somebody back here could help me with this film. That wouldn't be you, would it? It's me, all right. I was hanging some prints on the line to dry. What do you need help with? He came over and stood beside me. Nice pictures. Who took them? My brother. He's with the 51st Medical Company in Fubai. Oh, yeah? I was with the 1st Battalion, 69th Armor in the Bing Ding province. I was a gunner. A gunner? Yeah, a tank gunner. I took that in. Tanks are serious business. Shooting a gun rapid fire from the top of a tank is very serious business. It looks cool in the movies, but in real life, it has to be a tough job. But Corporal Yar Yarrow didn't look tough. He just looked like a sad, nice guy. So anyway, Corporal Yarrow continued, I went fishing down at Big Ben while I was on leave a couple of weeks ago, and the only thing I caught was what I caught on film, if you catch my drift. Fish weren't biting. They may have been biting something, but it wasn't anything dangling off the end of my hook. Still, the scenery was great and the beer was flowing, and I have lots of warm and fuzzy memories. He held up his film canisters. Not too fuzzy, I hope. I was going to drop the film off at the PX, but then this friend convinced me I ought to develop it myself since it's black and white and he thinks I need a hobby. So I taught Corporal Yarrow what to do and his pictures came out great. So then he brought, brought in his um, buddy, Private Garza, the one who told him how to develop his own film in the first place. And Corporal Yarrow and I taught Private Garza. I was a good teacher, which surprised me. I am not the world's most patient person, and I don't always do a great job of translating the thoughts in my head. But it was easy talking about how to develop film and print pictures. It helped that Carper Yarrow and Private Garza picked up on everything fast and found the process interesting. I remembered what Sergeant Bird told me the first time, the first day we worked in the darkroom together, that he was a process guy. I knew what he meant now. Every part of the developing process was interesting to me. Whenever I made a new discovery that a certain kind of paper worked better or that I got better results, results if the developing chemicals were a degree or two cooler, I was in a good mood for the rest of the day. On the days I printed TJ's pictures, I always drew an audience. It was like Private Hollister had put out a sign in front that said, Vietnam pictures on view today in darkroom. He always knew when I came in with the roll of TJ's film, and he'd always be the first one back to take a look. Don't show me nothing bloody, he'd say when I'd hold the, you know, the pictures. I can turn on the TV if I feel the need to see blood. Private Hollister especially liked TJ's pictures of the moon and of the pretty nurses. You think he's got a girlfriend over there yet, he asked one day, studying a blonde WAC holding a cat. How would I know? He just sends me the film. He doesn't write me letters. Private Hollister studied the photographs. 
I'd say he's writing you a letter with every picture he takes. Does he write letters to your folks? I nodded. They're boring, though. Mostly they're about the food and the bugs. See, he's sending you the real stuff. I bet you don't show all these pictures to your parents, do you? I bet you hide some of them away. <clears throat> what makes you say that? Cause, you know TJ don't want your folks to see him. If he wanted them to see all this stuff, he'd send the film to your mom, get her to process it at the PX. Don't cost but a few dollars. Private Hollister was right. I'd only shown certain ones of TJ's pictures to my parents. Pictures of dogs and mess halls and big jungle plants. But I'd known without him having to tell me that TJ wouldn't want me to show them everything. With each roll of film TJ sent me, there were fewer blonde WACs and more soldiers missing arms and legs, more medevac helicopters, more dust and dirt and chaos. One day, after I developed a roll of film and had the negatives hanging from the line to dry, I realized I was squinting as I examined them. It was as though I only half wanted to see what was there. It was as though I was scared to look any closer. I thought about waiting until the next day to print the pictures, even though it was early and Private Hollister said there wasn't much for me to do that day. I had all the time in the world to print pictures, but I found myself cleaning up, wiping down tables, measuring out more fixer, inventory and chemicals. Finally, I made myself slip the first negative into the enlarger. What emerged on the paper was a picture of a GI in a wheelchair, his right leg amputated at the knee and wrapped in a white bandage. He looked so much like TJ, I gasped, and I took a step back. I had to force myself to look again and see for sure that it wasn't my brother in the wheelchair, that it was someone I'd never seen before in my life. I decided to print the rest of the pictures later. Some of the soldiers who looked at TJ's pictures had been in Vietnam, and the pictures reminded them of, up or, of all sorts of things. You ever heard of rice patty stew? One guy asked me looking at a photograph of guys eating at the mess hall. You take your sea rations, like the beef and franks and beans, throw in some cheese spread and crackers and rice, and a bunch of tobacco, Tabasco sauce, and mix it all up and cook it. Nine times out of ten, it's better than whatever they're serving in the mess hall. The soldiers who had never been to Vietnam were the ones who got quiet when they saw TJ's pictures. Private Garza was like that. He was on the quiet side anyway, which made him a good sidekick for Corporal Yar. But when he got right down silent, sorry, but when he got downright silent is when he looked at TJ's photographs. The war's almost over, Corporal Yarrow told him one day when he was standing in front of a picture of a medevac helicopter lifting off, the sun setting behind it, dust billowing out in huge clouds beneath the propellers. Chances are you'll never get sent. Don't worry about it, man. Private Garza shook his head. It's not over yet. Any day, that's what they're saying, Corporal Yarrow put his hand on Private Garza's shoulder. Any day. There were afternoons I'd feel shaky leaving the rec center, anxious and a little bit nervous, and I just needed to get it out of my system. So I'd go to Cindy's house and tell her what I was learning about Vietnam. She was halfway interested in some of the things, not at all interested in others. Mostly she wanted to know if TJ had sent me more pictures of the moon. There was one in every roll, and I'd always make Cindy a print. By early August, she had a collection of them taped to her wall. Does Mark write you letters? I asked one afternoon sitting on Cindy's bed. Brutus nestled in my lap. Does he tell you anything about what it's like to be over there? He writes a big letter that's for everyone in my family, Cindy told me. He tells us about different things he sees, like the animals and the different kinds of flowers. Do you... You know, ever worry about them? I hugged Brutus close to me. Why would I worry about Mark? He's an army soldier. Fighting in wars is his job. I nodded. Fighting was a soldier's job. Everybody knew that. 
It was just somewhere down there in the pit of my stomach. I was starting to think that I didn't like fighting as much as I thought I did. I was starting to feel like I hadn't, like I wished TJ hadn't gone. Chapter 10 By mid-August, Private Hollister and I were neck and neck in our race to see who would be the gin rummy champ of Fort Hood. And we weren't the only ones paying attention to the competition. All the rec center regulars checked in at least once a week to see who was in the lead. They pulled Private Hollister's notebook right out of the top desk drawer and run their fingers down the rows of numbers, adding it all up. Most of them were rooting for me because I was so much younger, and a girl, I guess. The closer it got to Labor Day, the more often we'd draw a crowd when we sat down to play. Even Sergeant Bird would come out of the dark room from time to time to watch. Play them as they lay, my young friend. Hit them where it hurts. Don't let the crumb heads get you down, he'd say, or something else so Sergeant Bird-like. I'd know it was him with my eyes closed. So when's your last day, anyway, Private Hollister asked me one morning while we were trying to get some actual work done. I was underneath the pool table picking up beer cans and cigarette butts. Apparently, there had been quite a crowd the night before. Soldiers from the 1st Armored Division whose units were being sent to Vietnam. Friday before Labor Day, I guess, I called up to him from the floor. I picked up another cigarette butt and popped it into a paper bag. I wonder if any of those guys ever heard of that useful, useful invention known as an ashtray, I said, crawling out from under the pool table and rattling the bag at Private Hollister. It comes in handy, I've heard. Ah, uh, you know how it is when a guy's being sent off to war. Private Hollister leaned against the He was using to clean up the spilled beer off the floor. He gets a little wild. Mostly they're just scared, I guess, covering it up by drinking and yelling. I guess. Still, now in my, still, now my hands stink, and I think I'm about to come down with asthma. You don't come down with asthma. Asthma's just something you've got. It's a condition. I had it when I was a kid. I stood up and walked over to the trash can. Why do you want to know when my last day of work is anyway? Private Hollister grinned. I'm working up a strategy, and I need to know how many days I got to beat you fair and square. Your last day of work's going to be our official last day of playing gym, the way I see things. If I win, it is, but if I lose, I'm coming by after school. Doubt I'll be here much longer after Labor Day. I'll go back to my unit around then. What do you mean your unit? Private Hollister began pushing his mop along the length of the floor. Rec Center's a temporary assignment for me. I'm a radio officer. First signal troop. But they needed somebody here this summer, and I was the one who got pulled for the duty. Then they got another guy coming from Fort Sill sometime in September. He'll take over here, and I'll go back to where I came from. Then he stopped mop moping. Sorry. Then he stopped mopping and looked over at me. You think your dad knows who I am? I mean, have you ever mentioned me to him? Of course. I've been keeping him updated on our games and everything. What kind of stuff?